and welcome to another episode, episode 85 of <laughs> Jung at Harp. Today, we are going to talk about how to advocate for the human spirit and why and when. And um, as you may know, if you've been here before, we're not coming here with answers. We come with a question. It's not a question that we have the answer to. It's a question we want to explore. This is Kathleen Wiley. She is a Jungian psychoanalyst. I'm Deborah Henson Conant. I'm a composer and a performer. We both play the harp, though we may not play the harp in this episode. <laughs> and so we call this Young at Harp. And this is this podcast, this video cast, this connection is all about conversation, the power of conversation, the art of conversation, and what happens when you come to conversation, not to show and tell your side of things, but to discover something with someone else, or maybe more than one person. And that's why you are here. You are mm -hmm. also the more than we are. And so we are streaming this so that you can be part of that conversation in the chat. So today, Kathleen suggested many different subjects and which brought us to, which brought us um through death and destruction and all many things to the question how to advocate for the human spirit and i think you know i know both of us are very um moved by what's happening in the ukraine and um and don't really necessarily know what our place is as artists how to express solidarity and with who and how and how basically it came down to how do we advocate for the human spirit and when people are going through difficult things in their life whether it is their own personal difficulties or a difficulty huge like in a country how do we connect without losing our connection to our own lives how do we bring our life spirit to the situation and how do we advocate for the human spirit mm -hmm. so kathleen i don't know if you have any ideas about this <laughs> and i would like to encourage those who are listening we love your comments and um it, it, dur during the session we also love your comments afterwards they're beautiful but if you comment during the session we'd love to hear what your questions are or what your um your observations are of your own experience as as we're talking, as we're exploring this. So Kathleen, what are your thoughts here? You know, as you were talking, I, my, I've, I'm sitting to where there's a window outside and this gorgeous red car male cardinal landed on the um, rhododendron right out in front of my office and it caught my eye. And the color red, I always think about the alchemical stage of rubedo which is where our passions come into our body mind and energize us to take action and to make choices. And I think when I think about advocating for the human spirit, I always go back to the idea of my heart and the blood flow. And what is it that I have that passion for? And I, and I think you and a lot of you watching, we have a passion for human connection. We have a passion for having that connection with another that we share by virtue of the fact we are human beings. We have the same bodies that, although they work differently, they all work similarly. There, there's a template. And so I think part of it for me is making a space in, in ourself and then in our relationships for wherever people are on a feeling level and emotionally and we came together this morning just sharing where we each were emotionally and experientially around a number of things to hone this and distill down to okay what is it that really matters and how we move in life and it has to do i think with how do we advocate for the human being that life force that um gosh, it's the source of all creativity, both that which gives life and that which takes it away. And, you know, this is a, I'm circumambulating all around this, but I think about that in Celtic spirituality, the Dagda, who was the good God, played the harp. And I know I, I've probably shared this before, and the Dagda played three airs. He played the airs of laughter, the air of sleep, and the air of tears. 
So the laments, the, the lullabies, and then all of those jigs and reels, those happy dance songs. And it just makes me think when, when we're advocating for the human spirit, we've got to make room for all those states, for the tears of grief and the being and moving through losses, through that need to just really let go and sleep and rest and not overthink it. And then for joy and celebration and all the delights of life. So that's where I'm going to is that if I can be in relationship with myself and my instrument to make room for all of those experiences as they're coming up and then be present to other people in that way. Yeah, as you're talking, I'm thinking about, you know, um, being being present for others and being present for others who are going through difficulties. And you you talked about um, a situation. We, we talked about death and we talked about um, uh, being with somebody when they're dying, um, who knows that they're dying and who's asked for us to be there and um, or who's asked us not to be there, whatever. I mean, I, I'll just say straight out that, that, that my my mother had cancer and um, chose in the end of her life to, to end her own life. That was her choice. And um, she was in a Anyway, but and I asked to be with her at that time, and she was afraid to have me with her because she was afraid that that would that that could become you know, I could become you know, legally you know there could be a problem there. Sorry, I'm I'm stuttering on this. Uh, I'm stuttering because I'm not sure whether it's okay for me to talk about this, but this is a this is a truth. Mm -hmm. And so. I, because of that legal situation, I wasn't able to be with her. And so she ended up dying alone. And, and, uh, you know, and writing and, you know, I, you could see the writing, you know, beginning, you know, with her standard handwriting, and then, you know, eventually kind of tra trailing off. So there was that connection even at the end. But to be able to witness I think to be witnessing for each other. And I know that there are many harp players, for example, who play in therapeutic situations and often in hospice. And I think one of the most beautiful things is what music brings to that witnessing. Mm -hmm. And instead of taking what we're seeing and, um, oh God, it's... How do we witness others in a way that gives them strength? Right. Yeah, and, and I think what you're sharing, and, you know, your mother made a choice that I suppose people who, who decide not to have treatment and go into palliative care and hospice care now have some support in making, um, that she made a choice to move towards death consciously. And perhaps part of how we advocate for the human spirit is recognizing that there are times that we choose to move toward endings consciously. Sometimes it's the absolute ending of the physical death, but more often I think for, for us, there's oppor there are opportunities that come along where to step through this door and take this next professional step forward or commit to a relationship means the death of a life. You know, I got mm -hmm. married for a second time 10 years ago and it meant the death of a life. The life I had as a single woman doesn't mean I lost everything I had, but it does mean that that, that way of being and moving in the world and living died so that a new life could be born. And so I think there's also something about moving towards endings in our life with that sense of equanimity, knowing that on the other side is also life. And again, that that perhaps part of what the heirs of the Dagda tell us is there are different stages of our own experiencing of that process. Just like perhaps with your mom, that there was a celebration of her life as she made this decision and you all held that and she protected you in her death. Mm -hmm. And that then there's the sadness that you went into at the loss, you know, and, and then the need to just sleep and let something organic be at work so that you could then connect and come back into life with, with the joy and the laughter. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting as you're speaking, I'm thinking about when, 
um, so I'm thinking a lot about what's happening in the Ukraine. And here I am in a snowstorm in, in Boston and <laughs> with a show that's about to open in New York. And, and, you know, I've got my own life that I'm living. And yet, how do I advocate and how do I be part of that? How do I witness it in a conscious way that advocates for the human spirit, no matter where it is? And what value does that have? Mm. It's, I mean, I've seen I've seen people, or I've been in, in situations where I felt like, well, and countries do this all the time. Well, you're just taking advantage of some of some issue that somebody else is having to dramatize something in our own lives or whatever, mm -hmm. and that and that so it can become a um, something that's not a witnessing for the person who's going through it. But what do we get when someone is really truly? advocating for the human, our human spirit in terms of witnessing us and how can we bring that to others? I think that's the question that's really on my mind because mm -hmm. like, can I send something to Ukraine? No, it's not going to, it's not going to help. Can I, you know, talk about it? You know, wh where, where, where am I actually contributing to the human spirit in everything that's happening in something over there, as well as in my own life. You know, um, Carl Jung, of course, wrote a lot of different things, but one of the things that he said, and he was writing to um, the psychoanalyst and those who work with people, and I think this extends further than just with psychoanalysis, I think it extends to your work as a composer and an artist and to all of you who are listening in your work. He says, never forget that the work you're, this is a paraphrase of the quote, never forget that the work that you're doing with that one individual in your office contributes to, to the spirit, the infinitesimal spirit of humanity, that we are all connected and that how I choose to live, how you choose to live, how we choose to interact with the person right here makes a difference in the whole collective atmosphere that ultimately will inform how people all over the world treat each other. It's kind of how it, it, it's working in the in the. Um, it's not working on the front lines, but it's working with the roots in a way, you know, that if we're all connected vis-a-vis -vis the collective unconscious and we're all connected vis-a-vis -vis collective attitudes, co collective consciousness, so unconscious and consciousness, then how I respond to myself and how I respond to you makes a difference because it becomes like a little speck of sand in that atmosphere. And what kind of sand, what do we want in the atmosphere? You know, maybe a little particle of light might be a better metaphor than sand, but, you know, we want to be contributing things to the atmosphere, life giving and advocate for the human spirit. And that realize the complexities, you know, I was leading a case consultation for analytic training candidates a few years ago. And one of the trainees was presenting a case about a refugee who had um, in her own country and attempting to be to escape um, been raped by soldiers and just undergone horrific things. And um, there was someone who was also a training candidate who, who himself as a young man had been in one of the wars. And he spoke up and he said, but you, can, you can't condone the soldier either because they're also a part of their collective they're also they're also having their own traumatic experience. Wait a minute, and it was a, condone, wait a minute, you can't condone the right. soldier? You can't, what do you mean? You can't meaning you that mean? Uh, condemn is the word. We oh, can't oh, condemn. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay. We right. can't condemn that we can't condone or condemn. We can't get into either side of that because it's complex. And I think part of how we advocate for the human spirit is we remember things are complex that there's always more than meets the eye for information we're giving. So if we can stick with where we are in the moment with the person we are with in the moment or with the collective group we're with in the moment and try to track things down to the deepest essence of life force that's at work, then I think we can know how to advocate for the human spirit. 
Yeah, you know, as you're saying that, I realize we kind of got to this point in the pre and when we were conversing in the pre situation, in that um, one of my coaches is constantly saying to me when I say, how do I transform? How do I change? And he's constantly saying it's made of three things, awareness, mm -hmm. process, relationship. That's where transformation happens. And um, I was talking to a friend recently and, and I was talking about, you know, some, uh, some of us can get into hiding in our lives. Many of us can get into hiding. I think we all do. And she was saying, how do you know where you're hiding? <laughs> when you start living into that, how do you know? And so I was talking about the process that my coach gave to me for kind of breaking down um, actually resentments and fears and guilt that that helped me see where I was actually using um, using the fears and the resentments and the guilt to sequester in hiding places. And so um, I think what I'm hearing here in this conversation is that to get into awareness, to be witnessing, to be aware, to be responding, to be acknowledging, and you earlier before we started talking, we're talking about how do we even know what we're being fed is the truth? Any of us, how do we know that? I mean, and there's, there, I mean, I'm sure many people could be like, well, I know how you do this or, you know, do that. But, but I'm going to put forth that if we go into the world with one intention, for example, how to advocate for the human spirit, if I go into the news with that question, how do I advocate for the human spirit in this moment right now in everything I'm doing? That gives me my own lens in which to look at the facts that I'm going to be presented, which who knows if they're true? Who knows if the person who told that person is true? Who, we, we don't know. We've heard so many stories of where we're not getting the truth if we're not, if we don't know that we're getting the truth, how do we find our own truth? Maybe that's a question I would ask. And I'm thinking it starts with going into it with a lens of the question that's important to us. How do I, how can I be an activist, an advocate for the human, for the create, the human creative spirit? And can I see that in every situation? And can that help me find the truth? that will let me witness and also express in the moment. Because what else can I do? Otherwise I start to feel hopeless or I, you know, leave my own life, you know, and so we, I want to be present, as present as possible. Yeah, and you know, part of what you're saying, I think, is that we, we have to hold this attitude, which we model and, and hold together every when we come together, is that we only have one little piece of the truth and there's so much more the minute we start thinking we have the absolute truth then we're in trouble we're on a slippery slope so if we can keep alive our own sense of curiosity and our own sense of wonderment and our own sense of that that as Jung said our ego is a speck of light surrounded on all sides by darkness this is what we know surrounded by darkness and the darkness is always so much more meaning the unknown right um let me bring up some of the comments yeah. um so tovala said be in relationship yeah. so that we're 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 connecting that we're looking for that connection and and um and susan says i try to advocate with respect to others and to remain open to all emotions so advocating for right. others remaining open to all emotions. Life is filled with different and difficult situations. And I think she's saying, and I try to embrace all the happy and the sad. And, and as a musician, and as someone who I, I know for Susan, that she often plays in, you know, in, in, in nursing homes and, and, and hospice situations and situations where she's truly advocating for something that's important to her. Um, and advocating with her heart and with her music and with her willingness to show up. And she's saying life is being aware of everything in the human spirit and contributing to the connection, contributing to the connection, yes. you know, rather than to the polarization. Yes. And, yes. I, and I think that's what I hear you saying, Kathleen, is that here's the news and there's a lot of 
a lot of it. And underneath it is, is our intention in relationship to the world, our intention to advocate, like Susan is saying, with respect to others. And how do we, and, and the other thing I love that you said is these, you know, these are these specks of illumination. Yeah. And every time we can make that connection, we are creating more illumination for others to then also be able to advocate with respect to what's meaningful to them. Yeah, I sometimes think of it as that we're all, um, and I do this meditation sometimes, working with rhythmic breathing, which is one of the practices that we do in the um, Inner Divine Spirit Essential Embodiment Practices Online Circle, is with the rhythmic breathing, imagining that like I'm like one of those little dots on the radar screen, and that with the in-breath, my light gets bigger, and with the out ex exhale, it comes back into my center. And I just imagine that expansion and contraction. Well, you know, if I'm expanding and contracting light, love, acceptance, compassion, compassionate presence, which is my working definition of love these days, and you're doing that, then think about what that then begins to send out to perhaps other little specks of light that are feeling weak, are feeling oppressed, are feeling put upon, you know, that it makes it vibrational, it makes a difference, it's the resonance, you know, the harp is so beautiful in demonstrating that, that you pluck a string and it just resonates, it keeps going, and our spirit is like that, the reverse is true, we've probably all been to a party or all been at a meeting and here comes someone who comes in and they have always a nasty attitude and they're contentious and as soon as they walk in the room everybody's everybody's at, you know mood changes that also has a ripple effect that nasty vibration attitude has a ripple effect it affects the field and, and so and what if yeah. we and what if we choose there's so many things that are coming up I'm in the moment I'm thinking <laughs> and what if we choose not to react to that what if we choose not to and what if we choose to understand that every person who is having that kind of input is in pain who would have that if they weren't in pain who would do that that it's just it's just a lot of trouble well and I think part of the the gift of consciousness however mm -hmm. you go about becoming more conscious and part of the gift of strengthening the connection to your own center is you can then choose not to react part of the difficulty and part of the reason it requires consciousness and intention to not react is that the way we are our psyche operates unconsciously is there's a principle called entrainment and the biologists talk about this now and early developmental psychologists talk about this that there is something about the energetics of two physical bodies that will come in sync together hmm. so you know we see it in mother infants so the infant is fussy if the mother gets all agitated the infant gets more agitated. But if the mother can stay calm and soothing and sing those lullabies, then the infant's physical system also entrains to that and the spirit settles down. So it requires consciousness so that if if my center of light and calm and acceptance and non-judgmentalness is strong enough, then someone can come in and they can be like a bull in a china cabinet and I can still hold my own energetic space. But if it's not strong enough, the unconscious dynamics is they can take me over. We see that all the time. And I mean, Jung talked about it as mass psychosis and, and mob mentality. When people get in a group and they will they do things they would never do on their own. They get entrained. They get caught up in the atmosphere of the group. And they're not strong enough to keep themselves out of it. And so they get pulled along. So I'm thinking about this in terms of, you know, what I'm hearing in the news. And I'm also imagining, you know, if this was me, if I was the one who was putting my everything in a bag and getting in my car and hoping to travel in a, to a place. And I'm wondering what, first of all, would I, at that moment, does it matter what the, what the world is, is, is <laughs> what, what someone in, you know, 3,000, 6,000 miles away is feeling, um, and what is going to, what I'm, I mean, this is a conundrum because I, I don't have an answer. And, and, and I think anybody who would have an answer, I mean, we, we don't have an answer for this. But what I think I'm hearing that you say, you're saying is 
What we can do is keep going back to that intention. How do I advocate for the human spirit or whatever it is for mm -hmm. you? I, I have another one, which is, you know, why am I what, every morning I ask myself, what, why am I, you know, what am I? And why am I here? And I am here mm -hmm. to step out of my darkness with a light that illuminates when I touch others and understanding, okay, no matter what is happening, that is my purpose. And mm -hmm. my purpose is to advocate for the human spirit in any moment. And what I'm hearing is that that keeps me balanced so that I can listen to the news or I can listen to a friend or I can hear with, and sorry, I'm just, I feel like I'm starting to yell, but I, mm -hmm. it, it keeps me balanced so that I can hear without entraining, without getting caught into what, but, but actually be able to create a balanced, stable, grounded place from which I can witness and from which I can reach out or provide solace, or maybe at, the, at some moment there's something that is asked for that I'm like, wait, I can give that. Yeah. Oh, I can do that so that I can hear that so that I'm not, you know, stuck in something. And I'm thinking that that is what we can do. And, you know, I'm not there. So I don't know. I, I don't know what's meaningful. And I don't want to sit here and say, well, I can put my, I don't, I, I just don't, I don't, I, I can, sorry, I'm, I'm stuttering because it's, it's so easy to dramatize our place in the world. And it's so easy <laughs> to be like, well, those people are having trouble. So I'm going to d drink goat's milk or, and maybe that it does help. And sometimes I could imagine people saying, great, but you're not helping. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, again, all we can do is be where we are in the moment. Um, I, I'm thinking two thoughts. I'm thinking about the whole idea of play the heart that's in front of you, that every heart is different. And so play the heart that's in front of you. And so it's like, okay, so make the human connection that's in front of you and that that's what ultimately changes things. The second thing I'm thinking about is the importance of having practices, which of course is one of your strings of passion. Right. And that in the essential embodiment practices online sacred circle, we work with practices that are fundamental, that are basic to being able to hold our energetic center and our body mind. So we can move with the intention of our heart and not get pulled into other people's drama and other people's stuff. So that it requires practices to be able to really hold our center. And, you know, the 12 steps are a practice. Mm -hmm. You know, when mm -hmm. um, the people in the online circle work with rhythmic breathing or relaxation or mind awareness, those are practices. And I always say they're like going to the gym. You know, we go to the right. gym and we start out with five pound weights and we work up to 20 pound weights, not because we really want to be able to lift 20 pound weights, but we want to be able to lift the 20 pound bag of potting soil when we want to move right. it. Or if we're buying, you know, cans of beans, because, you know, in case the food supply gets, we want dried beans. I have a 75 pound container of dried beans myself, you know, and we want to be able to move that. We want the muscle to do it. And so the practices we have, the spiritual embodiment practices, the practices that we have at our instrument are like the, the gym workout so that when we then want to use it, it's there. <laughs> well, I'm really taken by this play the harp that is in front of you. Did you just make that up? Or have... No, I heard Har Harper Tash said that. Beautiful. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Beautiful. So shout out to Harper Tash. Um, I really love that. And um, so what does that mean? So to me, it means First of all, obviously, I have a harp that is was behind me, but is in front of me. But it also means that I can engage with the world in that way. And what does it mean to play a harp? So I just want to say that one of the things that it means to me is to have is to have a connection through through my voice and maybe through an extension of my voice mm -hmm. so that when I play the harp, the harp has no voice without me. My fingers have no voice without the harp. It is a, it's, it's 
it's a bringing into the world of a resonance. It's, it's the fact that m- these fingers don't make sound. Mm-hmm. And this instrument doesn't make sound without those fingers. Mm-hmm. So that connection is really important and that each of us are tuned more or less is relevant to how how we connect and how we as in me and this instrument are able to create a a true sound something that is it's it's, it's i mean i guess any sound is going to be true i mean any there's in any case when i'm playing the harp the more I can come to it with the spirit that I want to come. So the spirit I want to come to it is how to be an advocate for the human spirit. And in that way, it's a, you're talking about practice. I'm balanced within my appreciation for both the instrument and my fingers. Mm -hmm. and that connection and always coming out of i mean i'm coming back to the same harmony over and over again and i could change that harmony Mm -hmm. but always to come back to because i i might be engaging with someone else but always to come from that balanced place so that I can be listening to what is happening in that conversation, in that particular conversation. So what I'm getting out of this, this inquiry here, first, I love that, to play the harp that's in front of me, whatever that may be. It may be a harp, it may be a conversation, it may be the, you know, us talking to each other, it may be technology, but to play that and the one thing I can do is to keep coming back to my intention that in everything I do, in every harp I play, I am looking for how to advocate for the human spirit so that when the call comes of something I can do, I'm ready to do it. Yeah, as you were saying that, part of what came up for me is when we tune into our our deeper, larger self, when we tune into that spark of divine light, we are, and we stay in harmony with that tuning, then we can respond, we can tune in to where someone else in the, is in the world and respond in harmony with our own tuning, with our own nature and that we then encourage others to do the same and that's how we can advocate for the human spirit. Um, Harp to heart is, is posing a beautiful question, yeah. which was, you know, could we set a time? And of course, the answer, of course, is yes. <laughs> and it's a logistical, um, where we all play for peace separately, but together, like sending musical prayers, therapeutic mm-hmm. music for the world. Um, we certainly can. And, and um, you know, my question is always, and I'm sorry to say this, but I'm just going to say this is my question. When are we doing, are, are we, are we actually doing something when we do that? What, what are we doing? And I think that, I think that the, I'm always afraid, like I'm going to be doing something and I'm going to be like, yes, I'm raising my flag for the bomb, 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 bomb. And I'm just making myself feel like I'm doing something. This is me afraid of me. I'm always afraid of that. And so when we do this, you know, what Harp to Heart is suggesting or anything else that we might do, how do we make sure, and I, we have like, what, one minute or two minutes or something? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I think I know the answer because I think it's what we've been saying, but I distrust myself. Well, but you are also raising a question that has been around for centuries, which is, does the mind and the spirit have power if 
science and matter can't track it. And so I just want to throw out that a, several, a, a couple of decades ago, Larry Dossie, who was a medical doctor, did research in hospitals to see if prayer had an effect on healing. Hmm. And he set up all of the scientifically sanctioned control groups. And the result of his research is that the groups of people who were prayed for anonymously healed more quickly and had less complications. His scientific experiments proved that prayer makes a difference. Now, I'm sure there are other people who've done research since that. But to answer mm. your question, I think that that there is scientific research from his work, and I'm sure others, again, have done it. I just haven't kept up with it. I don't need the scientific research to believe it makes a difference. <laughs> Some people do. <laughs> um, but I also want to say to your point of, Am I, is this for them or is this for me? And, you know, maybe what we, what is behind that question is the flawed paradigm that we're somehow separate. Mm. And that if we believe that we are all connected on some level energetically, from Jung it was we're all connected vis-a-vis -vis the collective unconscious. If we believe we're all connected somewhere at some, some for me, it's a very deep, deep, um, non-rational level, then everything that we do for us is also for someone else. That a life-affirming action for ourselves is also a life-affirming action for another. And heart to heart, it's just asking, can it be for both ourselves and others? Absolutely. That's, I don't yeah. think it's separate. I, I agree. We, yeah. Yeah. And the same is true. If I do something hurtful towards me, I say I engage in self hate towards me, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then that has an effect on the collective that is also negative. So the, the, we have to move beyond this paradigm that somehow we are separate and don't affect each other on some deep, deep level energetically we are connected and we affect each other and various systems of thought can look to the outside world to see how we are connected economically blah 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 yeah and you yeah. know it's really interesting as you're talking i'm thinking um like can we come together and advocate for uh, and then my brain was like well are you advocating for this side or for this side and then i said wait 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 i'm not advocating for this side or this side I'm advocating for outside or inside. I'm can can we come together and advocate for the human spirit without having to decide can we advocate in a heartfelt connected way for that human spirit to find truth to to clarity um so was so I love you know yeah. heart to hearts suggestion and and I'm just going to say that until someone whether it's me or somebody else sets that up I'm going to encourage all of us all at the same time or at different times to be playing and thinking in that way and I'm just going to go back to um to exactly what um, Harp to Heart said, could we set a time where we all play for peace separately, but together, like sending musical prayers, therapeutic music for the world. I'm, I'm inviting every one of us, me included, to actually do that, that we don't have, that you've just made the call to us, you've just offered that, and for us to do that until and including when somebody organizes that together. And, um, and Susan is saying, um, we send out vibrations from our harp to, to the hearts of others. We are all connected in the human spirit. And I'm just going to turn that into an active verb. We are all connecting in the human spirit. And when we do that, we are connecting. Does that mean we therefore don't need, you know, there may not be more and more practical things to do? M maybe and maybe not. But what I'm hearing you say, Kathleen, is that until that moment becomes clear of what the the more practical action is, we can become ready in our right. own spirits to be able to be balanced, connected, advocating for the human spirit on every single level 
and you know be listening to the truth for the truth in what we're hearing that's right yeah and i think that that if as a takeaway for today i can hold more intentionally i hold this intention anyway but to really hold that i want to be an agent of healing and light which means i want to hold the intention of loving compassionate presence to myself and every every sentient being i encounter and if i do that and i bring that attitude and spirit to bear and every piece of information i receive about what's happening in the world then perhaps I will make a contribution to that atmosphere that will be life-giving. Yeah, I love that. And I, and I too want to make that commitment to be advocating, not having to wait to advocate, but advocating in every moment of my life and in, and in playing the harp that's in front of me, whatever that harp is in the moment, um, to be advocating, praying, whatever, whatever it is that's happening in that moment for the, the life-giving force, the, the, in, in, in every single human who is in every single human, no matter what they may seem like, who's in this conflict and other conflicts and, and, and other connections and really be rooting for every single um, right. connection that gets made. Right. That's right. So thank you, Kathleen, for, you know, taking on this sort of thorny, you know, how do we, how do we deal with this in our lives? Because it's going to come up and we may be in the center of the conflict. We may be on the outskirts, but we are all connected in this world. And how can we make that more conscious, more loving, with more advocate, being more advocates for the human spirit and playing that harp that's in front of us? That's right. yeah. Thanks, Kathleen. And thank you for everybody who's listening and, and who, who, you know, let us know in the chat, Tovala and Susan and Harp to Heart and, mm -hmm. and everybody else. Thank you so, so much. And Kathleen, thank you for being part of this inquiry week after week. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.